quickly, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Zohar. Fortunately, Ashbam IC is not here yet, so you can't be angry at me. Okay, so this is some background on high energy physics. Okay, so, so traditionally when we talk about high energy physics, um, what you might say, what you might put in your grant proposal, is that you're studying the fundamental building blocks of nature. That's supposed to be what makes high energy physics special. Um, of course, this is a little bit like modern art, right? Because because what was fundamental yesterday might become emergent today. So, for example, um, following what we might call high energy physics, okay, historically, um, we learned that people are made out of cells, which are made out of proteins, which are made out of atoms, which are made out of protons and electrons, which are made out of the standard model particles. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll keep going in this direction. Um, however, unfortunately, this strategy is getting harder to pursue. And the problem is that the more we learn, well, it gets more expensive to do an experiment that we don't already know the outcome for. And you know, you can hope that somehow developing technology will help you keep up with that. And it has some life, but I'm not sure if it will continue or not. But we can hope. Um, and as one illustration, let me just point out that if you have a synchrotron collider like the LHC or the Tepatron, um, then roughly speaking, uh, if you hold, you know, things like the strength of magnets that you can be fixed and so on, then the energy of the collision scales like the square root of the radius. And that's not so good, right, because the radius is already 4 kilometers at the LHC. So if we want to make it, you know, 4 times higher energy, we have to make it 16 times bigger and so on. Um, and maybe we'll get one more round out of that. Uh, maybe we'll get two, I don't know, but it's not easy. So so uh, so then, what are we supposed to do in the meantime, right? Well, you know, we need to keep writing papers and posting them to have TH and so on. So so so, what do we do? Well, one option is you can just work on something else. <laughs> here, here, are, here are two popular options. Uh, and I don't want to downplay this. This isn't crazy. There are lots of interesting things going on, and you have to decide how to optimize your time. Okay. On the other hand, you can just persist. After all, it's important to know about the fundamental building blocks of nature. And this, I want to hopefully convince you that that's not crazy either, because there are a lot of phenomena which we already have observed, we don't even need more experiments, that we don't know how to explain using the standard model of particle physics and cosmology. So if the obvious one is gravity, we feel it every day, it's not in the standard model, we don't know how to make a self-consistent theory of it. Although we have progress. Dark matter is another one. Again, we've seen it, it's real. Neutrino masses, baryogenesis, inflation, or if you want to be a little more conservative, you can just say the anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background. Don't know how to reproduce that without introducing additional fields beyond the standard model. So let me emphasize, since recently there's been a lot of confusion about this in the popular media, these really are not like aesthetic or philosophical problems, right? Like we use the standard model, we do a computation, we trust the computation, and it gives you the wrong answer. It's not what you see from experiments. Uh, so we need to come up with a new theory to explain experiments. Now, there's a qualitative difference between gravity and other phenomena on this list. Um, and that's that it's not too hard to come up with possible models of particle physics which account for the things on this list other than gravity. Um, and, and you can also address, if you want to, these more sort of aesthetic questions like the strong CP problem or the hierarchy problem to the extent that you choose to worry about them. So and then this leads to a situation where actually there's not just one such model like this, there are lots of models. Uh, I would say no particular one of them is particularly nice. Um, so, you know, people keep coming up with more, and it's good because maybe there is a nice one that we haven't just found, that we just haven't found yet, right? Um, but, you know, arguably, plausibly, you know, what you really need is, is more experimental data to kind of break the degeneracy. Um, gravity is different because the opposite is true. We don't even have one self-consistent theory of gravity um, that fits the data that we already have. So you can make up sort of silly gravity theories that you know live in one plus one dimension and there's not. But, um, okay. What was there a comment? I said don't make fun. Don't make fun. <laughs> hey, I just wrote a paper on one plus one dimensional gravity. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Um, 
So and actually, I would, say, I would say this is ideal for theorists, right? Because you don't even need more experiments, right? You don't even have one theory that fits the experiment. Right? So, you know, of course, still more experiments are good. I'm not saying don't make the experiments, but we don't necessarily need them right now to make progress. Uh, and, and that may sound controversial, although it really shouldn't. Um, you know, there are many examples in the history of science. One of my favorites, um, which I talked about maybe a year ago, uh, in the Strings Conference in Okinawa was Maxwell's study of the rings of Saturn. So uh, in the, in the talk, I don't have time to explain that here, uh, but I, I recommend you use the internet to read at least the beginning of Maxwell's paper about the rings of Saturn. Uh, and from that beginning, hopefully you'll see what I said in my talk in Japan, which was that Maxwell was a string theorist. At least in the sense that he was pursuing the same, you know, using the same techniques that we use today in a similar situation. You know, it took a hundred years before his theory of the rings of Saturn was tested by experiment. It, it directly confirmed by experiment. Now, uh, in recent years, there have been kind of two main things that have been going on, and both of them are going to be represented in this session, which is what I'm supposed to be introducing. So, the first strategy is we, as you said, uh, just say, okay, we'll uh, st first study the non-realistic corners of street theory where we have mathematical control, and in particular the idea of CFT correspondence and a set of supersymmetric compactifications. Um, so these are sort of non-realistic theories of gravity that we have come up with. Uh, and have some control over, and then we can hope to learn lessons which you can generalize to more realistic situations like the one we actually find ourselves in. So for example, uh, one question that many people are thinking about now, how do we understand the black hole interior in EDS-CFT? You know, black holes in anti disitter space aren't that different, we think, from black holes in Minkowski space or disitter space, especially if they're small compared to the scale of the cosmological constant. So maybe if we can understand them in ADS, you know, we can resolve the deep puzzles of black hole information and so on. Then that resolution can just sort of be ported over and maybe along the way teach us new things about how to think about cosmology and so on. Um, another question, which actually is not totally unrelated from the first one, is um, what are the restrictions on the low energy effective field theories that we can get out of consistent theories of quantum gravity? So one such lore is that uh, low energy effective field theories that come from gravity can't have exact global symmetries. Uh, so that's certainly not true as a statement about effective field theories. We've got lots of effective field theories, including gravity, that have global symmetries, but we don't think that those can be completed into self-consistent, you know, non-perturbative theories of quantum gravity. Uh, and so this kind of question of, you know, somehow gravity is more constraining. The inclusion of gravity makes things much more constraining than if you don't have gravity. And that shouldn't be too surprising. For example, you probably know that you know, something even less constrained is non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But as soon as you try to add relativity, then you're basically stuck doing quantum field theory. You, know, you, you, kind of, you might have thought that relativistic quantum mechanics would have lots of options, but it seems that quantum field theory is the only option. Uh, now, there's still a lot of quantum field theories, but even then those get more constrained once we want to try to get them together with gravity. OK, so trying to understand that is kind of option four. Option two is just say, okay, I'm going to take a break from gravity, that's too hard, and I'm just going to try to understand better quantum field theory. Uh, you know, essentially, a, it's, it's a sort of mathematical subject, right? So, you know, mathematicians, right, you know, they like, like to, for example, they like to classify things, right? Like, what are all the Lie algebras? What are all the three manifolds? This kind of thing, right? So, in quantum field theory, we can ask questions like that also, right? Like, what are the conformal field theories? What are the topological field theories, or since it's kind of matter, I should say, what are the topological phases? I mean, so morally, this is the same kind of question as trying to classify three manifolds. It's a mathematical question. It's not like, oh, there's some experiment, right? It's just, I want to know all the options. Uh, you know, other sort of general questions about quantum field theory, right? How do correlation functions behave at very long times at finite temperature? Uh, what are the correlation functions of n equals 4 or Susie Yang Mills at large n and finite? So, so, you know, probably, you know, 80% of the papers on, on HEPTH every day, mm -hmm. roughly speaking, are going to be in one of these two categories. Now, I want to emphasize that these strategies, you know, they seem I presented them as being disparate, but, but in fact, they're, they're kind of closer than you might think. So, certainly, ADS-CFT connects the two of them, um, but they're also connected in other ways. And actually, there's a strong interplay between the two, and so it's not like there are people who only do this and people who only do this. Like, you know, most people kind of spend a little bit of time in one camp or the other at, at various times. Uh, 
and, and maybe some of that interplay will show up in the talks today. Anyway, I think that's it for my 10 minutes, so I don't know, I don't know if I accomplished anything, but hopefully maybe you'll learn something. Unless anyone has a question. I'd like to make one comment. Now he has a comment. Yeah. I'm sure it's a comment, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make one comment. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this was a beautiful summary, spectacular, except one thing that I think was fundamentally wrong and certainly should not be said. It's not that we're doing what we're doing because we have to fill the time. And we have nothing else to do. <laughs> we're doing what we're doing because it's very important. <laughs> well, you had something about, well, maybe we should write some books and this and that until we have more information. I think this is wrong and this should not be a reason. I mean, I'm doing it right. I don't like wasting my time, so I think it's worth my time. Yeah, no, I mean, I do think it's important. I mean, we have this list of phenomena that we see and we can't explain. So. Comments like these are being used against us. So, <laughs> in, addition to the fact, in addition to the fact that they are wrong. <laughs> Well, I'm okay. I'm okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not talking to the New York Times. Right? <laughs> Is it recorded? Uh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've said much worse things that were recorded. So this is, uh, this is All right, let's have a real physics talk. So, uh, all right, so it's uh, let, let, oh, there's another. You can feel the chair. There's lots of. Yeah, why don't we, okay, yeah, why don't you come in while we're here? There's lots of space. There are more chairs here, too, actually. I don't know if the fire will be angry. Lots of space inside. Yeah, there are two seats right in the front here. Yeah. Two seats right the front. The one